on. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for being in the chat room. That's great. All right, we're recording here. It is uh, Chemistry 2330. We're starting our week eight. So we only have 15 weeks in the semester, including finals week. So we're actually moving right along there. Uh, we're right on target with chapter nine we're going to do today. So do this week, of course, is the full video for this will be on um, it will be on is on YouTube already on the other channel, the uh, Introduction to Organic Chemistry channel. The live section here will be posted on our uh, 2330 YouTube channel. And homework for chapter 10 will be due today, I mean, uh, on October 16th. And that's this Friday. And then chapter nine will be due later. So uh, welcome back. Again, if you are taking the lab, please look at those um, uh, emails I sent out in the lab schedules. You have a lab to do every single week, whether it's in person or online. So make sure you uh, keep track of those things and get them on your schedule. All right, so um, that being said, are there any questions about the class or lab as far as uh, uh, due dates, et cetera? Okay, well, if you do, go ahead and put it in the chat room. I'll try to remember to get it there. Uh, somebody's in the waiting room. There we go. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my slides. And just like last time, I'm actually gonna do the full slides on this one because there's a lot of detail associated with this. When I go back to spectroscopy, I'll be doing the goal slide. But this is for, uh, I believe this is the best way to do this particular chapter because of all the cool detail associated with it. All right, and I'm sharing my iPad now, and I'm pulling up my uh, scatter view up over here so that I can watch you if you start waving your hands at me, okay. All right, so uh, up to now, we've looked at a bunch of different concepts about how we had, um, you know, sp3 and sp2 and different reactions we had, okay, and Alcohols, ethers, thiols, and amines all had acidic hydrogens. That's why I wanted to do those all together. So that's why I kind of did it slightly out of order. And now I want to bridge a new topic. And the topic is what we call benzene and its derivatives. But the big deal here is that because of the special property associated with benzene, they don't react like everything else. And that's what we ought to figure out why and how to use that to our advantage. Okay. So Back in the heyday when organic chemistry was just kicking off, it was a big industry in, in, in uh, Germany and, they, and the Americas. And we they found that different compounds had different reactivities and different smells and different weird things that were happening. And they could figure out that how many carbons something had, what its molecular weight was, and whether or not it had double bonds. Okay, so they came up with this nice compound and it had a really cool smell and a whole bunch of derivatives of it had different cool smells. And so what they did at calling them was aromatic compounds, okay? So we really didn't know what aromatic meant other than they smelled different than other compounds. So after deriving the idea that they, they, they knew it had six hydrogens and six carbons, uh, uh, Auguste Kekulé decided, okay, it must be this ring here. And we know what double bonds do and we know what single bonds do. And so I think that, you know, we have these alternating single and double bonds and that it doesn't matter which way I draw the Lewis dot structure, it's just, it can be either way, okay? Unfortunately, when they tried to compare it to other things with double bonds, it didn't behave the same, okay? So there had to be something different about this molecule, about aromatic compounds in general that made them special, okay? So wait a few years, about uh, 30 years or 60 years, sorry, and they <laughs> the concept of, Orbital hybridization came out about in the 1930s. That's that whole sp3, sp2, sp thing. That didn't come out until the 1930s to help describe, number one, the geometric shape of molecules and their reactivity and what orbitals were available to bond. Okay. Once they got this concept of hybridization down, they went back and looked at benzene ring and decided that the carbons in the benzene ring must be sp2 hybridized because they were 120 degrees apart. And that means it's trigonal planar, nice and flat with 120 degrees. And so that left one P left over, okay? Now, if we look at all the bonds in this uh, compound we see here, 
we'll see that all of the bonds are 120 degrees right here. And the bond distances here are a little different than we would expect, okay? So this bond is about where we expect, but this is a little bit less than a double bond. I mean, a single bond, but a little bit more than a double bond. So that was another anomaly that they were trying to figure out for us. So if this is our sp3, sp2 hybridized carbons, where's the p? Okay, where can we put that p orbital? So uh, what we can do is we can say, well, okay, well, if each of those sp3, uh, sp2 hybridized compounds, uh, carbons is a trigonal planar thing, that means the p orbital must be coming out of the plane of that. So if we draw the p orbitals around this benzene ring, what we see is that each of the p orbitals is above and below the ring made by the sigma bonds, all the carbons together, and that each of these has a single electron in it. If we did our calculation and counting our electrons, that each one would have a single electron. Okay, so that's kind of cool in the fact that, okay, we figured out, number one, where the double bonds are, and gosh, uh, is the double bond here, here, and here? Or is it here, here, and here? Well, the answer is yes, because all of those p orbitals are in the same plane as each other. They're all equivalent. So what we see, instead of actually having double bonds in any fixed position, that double bond character is shared around the entire group of p orbitals on the top of the ring and the entire group of p orbitals on the bottom of the ring. And so this tells us we have something different going on. We don't have an isolated double bond. We have shared electrons across six atoms. Okay. And that's the important part here is that we have equally shared electrons over six atoms in those p orbitals. Okay, so how can we use this? Okay, so if we go back to Kekulé, Kekulé was saying, well, you know, we have a single bond, double bond, single bond, and that we only have six carbons and we only have six hydrogens, okay? So he said, well, let's draw it this way. And then his friend said, no, let's draw it this way. What's the difference? Well, in uh, your um, uh, Lewis dot structures, they're equivalent. So there's nothing wrong with either one of these. However, it didn't react like a double bond and a single bond and a double bond and a single bond. So they had to come up with some different rules associated with this. So if this was equivalent to this, what if you started blending them together so rapidly that neither one of those two little, neither one of those two Lewis dot structures existed at all? Okay. And if we do that, we have what we call our resonance energy. We have a blended structure. Remember, resonance is when we can draw multiple uh, uh, electron configurations in a Lewis dot structure, and they are of equivalent energy. So now if we can do that in a ring like this, we have what we can gain is what we call resonance energy. It's the difference in energy between the resonance hybrid and its most stable hypothetical uh, you know, uh, structure. So in this case here, this is a stable hypothetical structure and this is a stable hypothetical structure, but benzene has a different energy. It's less, it has, uh, it's, it, it has a greater stability than you'd expect it to. And so that difference between this structure here and this structure here means there's something else. That's our resonance structure. And that energy that gives us our stability is called our resonance energy. Okay, so how does that, um, how do we measure this? Okay, how do we say that benzene isn't just three double bonds and three single bonds, it actually has some kind of stabilization associated with having all of these orbitals on top be the same and all the orbitals on the bottom be the same? Well, one of the ways we do this is we actually use the heat of hydrogenation to measure the difference in energy. So if we think about it, an alkene, or a double bond has a certain energy. And when you add, you have a pi bond, and when you add hydrogen across that pi bond, it releases heat, okay? So if we do that, and we just have a regular uh, cyclohexane here with one double bond in it, 
and we add one equivalent of hydrogen across that double bond, it releases 120 kilojoules of per mole of heat. Okay, so it goes from being something with stored energy to releasing that energy and being in its most stable form. Okay, so in theory, if we had three double bonds here, one, two, three, each of these double bonds should be equal and therefore it should be 120 for one of them, 120 for another one, and 120 for another one. But when we measure it, that's not what we get. We actually get 209 kilojoules of energy released, okay? So what does that look like, okay? So if we just had cyclohexene right here, we added that one equivalent of hydrogen across it, it releases this much heat, okay? And it becomes the more stable compound. If we had theoretically total of three double bonds, that should be 360 kilojoules per mole to get back to that same cyclohexane. But that's not what we see. <coughs> when we measure it, it's only 209, meaning that there's 150 kilojoules more stable than if it was three isolated bonds by itself. That 151 kilojoules is our resonance energy. The more energy stabilized it is because of that sharing of electrons. <coughs> Excuse me. Woodworking and I have sawdust in my throat, sorry. Okay, so the concept here is that benzene is lower in energy than if it was three individual double bonds meaning sharing those electrons saves energy. And that saving of energy is called our resonance energy. Now, if it's saving energy and it wants to be uh, in resonance, it wants to have this structure, that means it's gonna take a different kind of reaction to break that up apart. Okay, so, <coughs> This works not only for a single ring, in the case of benzene here, right here, but what it also works for is the idea that we can have multiple rings, as long as they're flat, and as long as they have the right number of electrons, you'll get this same resonance stability over bigger and bigger ring systems. Okay. So, what we see here is that, you know, it's not just isolated to a single ring, we can expand that to multiple rings. And they all have that same stabilization of energy. They all have that resonance energy to make them react differently than just having regular double bonds. Okay. <clears throat> so to have this resonance stability, your compound has to be aromatic. This goes back to, oh, they smell different. So maybe they're aromatic. Okay. So drawing on that concept here, aromaticity took on a different value once they figured out that there was sp2 hybridized orbitals and those p orbitals overlapping, okay? So Ulrich Huckel decided that there must be rules associated with this because some compounds with three double bonds have the stability and some compounds with three double bonds don't have the stability. So he came up with a set of rules, okay? So to be aromatic, to have that stabilization of energy, you must one, have a ring, okay? So that's your number one rule, you must have a ring, okay? And if you can imagine that, that means that the electrons can flow evenly around a ring, and so a ring is required to do this aromaticity. The second thing you have to have is at least one p orbital on each atom of that ring, okay? So that means those orbitals have to be that p, that unhybridized p, so they can all overlap and be the same. So that ring also must be planar or nearly planar. Why? Because you want those p orbitals to kind of all line up. And therefore, if they're all lined up and you have one on every single ring, it makes a continuous or near continuous ring to allow these electrons to flow around. Now, the last rule is it has to have a certain number of electrons in those p orbitals, okay? And the rule is that it has to have the 2, 6, 10, 14, or 18, okay? Most important one is benzene, because it has six, and we'll talk about why this is. 
there's actually a rule for this. It's called the uh, 2n no, plus 2 rule, where n is equal to any number from 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. Any integer. Okay. Now, why does that work? Well, if this is 0, that means 2. If this is 1, 2n plus 2, uh, sorry, 4n plus 2 is 6. If it's 2, that'd be 8 plus 2 is 10. So 4n plus 2, if you don't want to remember the numbers, or 2, 6, 10, and 14, if you want to remember. Okay, does benzene meet these four requirements? Ring, p orbital on each atom, nearly planar so that all those p orbitals can overlap, and does it have that many electrons in p orbitals? So we know that benzene is planar because it's sp3 hybrid, sp2 hybridized carbons all the way around. We know that it's cyclic because it's a ring of six. We know that it has at least one p orbital on every single atom. And if we count the double bonds, we know that there's one, two, one, two p or one, two electrons in this pi bond, one, two electrons in this pi bond, one, two electrons in that pi bond. So we have six electrons. So benzene meets every single rule to be aromatic. And because it does, we can also extend that over multiple systems. Uh, notice this right here, okay? Let's look at this. It's flat, it's a ring, but it also has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten electrons. Ooh, it meets that other rule, the two, six, ten. So, okay, so there are four rules to have something be aromatic. And once it's aromatic, it wants to stay aromatic because of that stability of energy, okay? which means it won't react like other double bonds. Okay, so does it have to be carbon? And the question, that answer is no, it does not have to be carbon. Remember, our rules that we stated up here were it has to be in a ring, every atom has to have a p orbital in it, and it has to have a certain number of electrons, which means we can have things that are called heterocyclic compounds. Hetero meaning different, so something other than carbon can be in the ring and it can still be aromatic, okay? So when we have all the rules met for aromaticity, we have what we call heterocyclic aromatic compounds. Remember when we did amines, we had those heterocyclic amines where you had an amine in the middle of a ring, okay? This is a new subclass of that called heterocyclic aromatic compounds because they meet the rules for aromaticity. Okay, so let's say why this meets the rules for aromaticity, okay? So in this case here, we have this nitrogen has three things bonded to it, but it has a lone pair, and therefore it has sp2 hybridization, and if it has sp2 hybridization, that means it has a p left over, okay? So which means that there's one, two p, uh, pi electrons, one, two pi electrons, one, two, so a total of six pi electrons, it's in a ring, there's a p orbital on every single atom, okay? And it's flat. Therefore, it meets all the requirements. So pyridine is an aromatic compound. It just happens to be a heterocyclic aromatic compound. And we can add as many other atoms as we want as long as it meets all four rules. So in this case here, we have this, both of these nitrogens are sp2 hybridized with a p orbital that it contributes to the aromaticity. And so this ring, this pyrimidine is also aromatic because it follows all the rules. <clears throat> okay, so whenever you look at a compound that you think might be aromatic, make sure it follows all four rules. If it follows all four rules, it's gonna have different reactivity than if it doesn't. All right, <clears throat> so let's talk about pyridine a little more in detail. And I wanna show you that it has all of the uh, orbitals we say it does. Okay. So the first thing I wanna look at here is just the carbons right here. So all the carbons right here look exactly like the carbons in benzene. So they, they're, we're gonna call that just fine, okay? And our nitrogen here, <clears throat> which I'm gonna do in red ink right here, this nitrogen, notice it's sp2 hybridized, okay? Because it's got one, two, 
three bonds and it's trigonal planar, they're 120 degrees apart, which means it's sp200. Okay, but that also means that this orbital here, that p orbital, is contributing an electron to the ring. Notice this right here, this lone pair here, that low pair is in an sp2 hybridized orbital. It makes up the trigonal planar, the 120 degrees apart. So those electrons don't count for aromaticity because they're in a different type of orbital. Only this electron counts for it. So now we have one, two, three, four, five, six electrons in our p orbital in our p orbitals. So we're flat, we're planar, we're ring. We have p orbitals and we have six electrons. So pyridine is an aromatic compound. Okay. Notice that in this case here, our lone pair that all, all nitrogens have a lone pair on them, right? As long as they're neutral, <clears throat> is sticking out. It's not part of the aromaticity. But can that lone pair be part of the aromaticity? Maybe. We'll see. Okay. So, do all aromatic rings have to have six atoms in them? And the answer is no. And the reason it's no is because if you have a heteroatom with a lone pair in it, that can contribute two electrons to a ring. And so therefore we can have four membered, and, I'm sorry, we can have five membered, six membered, and sometimes even seven membered aromatic rings if they have the right number of electrons. So let's draw attention to these first two. In this case here, our heteroatom is now oxygen, okay? These are carbons, so we're gonna expect them to exa act exactly like the, the carbon in benzene. And these are the oxygen. <coughs> so this oxygen, which normally, when it's sp3 hybridized, is bent, right? It has two lone pairs there, and it's bent. <coughs> Excuse me, however, this oxygen is sp2 hybridized. So that means that it has oxygen with that and then the lone pair, is, and all of these are 120 degrees apart now. Okay. Uh oh, here we go. All right. So all of those are, at, are, are 120 degrees apart which means the pi orbital is coming above and below that plane. So <coughs> if this is sp2 hybridized and we have a lone pair sticking out as sp2 hybridized, that means we have two electrons in our p orbital, okay? So we have a flat ring, flat a ring. We have p orbitals on every single atom. And how many electrons do we have? One two, three, four, five, six, six electrons. That means this substitution with an oxygen and having two electrons in that P orbital makes it an aromatic ring, okay? And we can do that same thing for nitrogen. But in the case of this parole, we're actually using the lone pair to contribute to the aromaticity, okay? So again, we start with our nitrogen here and it's sp2 hybridized, which leaves it one lone pair available. These are of course all carbon-like, all carbon atoms. And now both of these electrons are contributing to the six electrons to make it aromatic. Therefore, its lone pair does contribute to aromaticity. But in the case of pyridine, its lone pair does not contribute to its aromaticity. And that's why there was a difference in basicity between those two compounds, because one does contribute to aromaticity, one does not. Okay. <coughs> Questions on the four rules of aromaticity. All right, so we'll move on. So there's a lot of different ways we can use aromatic compounds. A lot of these are, uh, all of these aromatic compounds here are used in biological systems. 
We have serotonin, endol, purine, uh, endomine, and all of these are biologically active molecules. And notice all of these are heterocyclic systems, and they all are fused systems. Okay. Notice that if we looked at aromaticity, this ring right here is aromatic because it meets all the rules. However, if we share, if we use the electrons in this ring here, this is also aromatic and meets all the rules. So each of those rings individually is aromatic in, in addition to being the system as a system. So you can have, yes. Question? Question? Type it in the chat room. All right. Uh, so what I've just noticed is whenever the nitrogen is attached, yeah. Yeah, I can, I can hear him intermittently. Uh, when nitrogen is bonded to a hydrogen, does it not contribute to the p orbital? Okay. Ah, interesting point. When there's a nitrogen bonded, I mean, when there's a hydrogen bonded to nitrogen in any of these com compounds, that means the lone pair is contributing to aromaticity. So the lone pair that would be here is the part that's contributing to aromaticity. So if there wasn't a nitro, if there wasn't like right here, there's no hydrogen on there. That means the lone pair is sticking out and it has just a single electron in its P orbital. But if you have a hydrogen sticking on it, that's the lone pair contributing to aromaticity. So no, let's count our electrons here. If that's only one electron because the lone pair is sticking out here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six to make our thing. Interesting, I had not actually drawn attention to that in the past. So um, it's always a p orbital. It's just whether or not there's one electron or two electrons. That's what we're looking for in the system, okay? Okay, so the fact that we can use these aromatic compounds in our bodies a lot, and it's used for everything from mood rate modifiers to, to absorbing proteins, okay? So we're gonna see them used a lot in systems. And as we get to these more complex structures, they tend to have common names. But before we get to the common names, we're gonna talk about a little bit of the nomenclature. Okay. Now, because benzene is its own class, and you might notice that on the, the, um, the review of nomenclature on Canvas, on the last page, there's one last column for aromatic compounds because aromatic compounds tend to name the, com the common name differently depending on which group is attached to it. So what you'll see is that there will be common names for all these things in that's on the chart. Okay, I, somebody was trying to say something. I, I didn't, I just heard noise, sorry. Okay, so let's talk about nomenclature. And so the first thing we wanna say is that nothing on the benzene ring is benzene, okay? So this is always benzene. And if it's a substituent on a long chain with no other functional group on the benzene, it's counted as the phenyl group and it's always a substituent. Okay. However, if the benzene has a common name of higher, like if it's an alcohol here with an alkyl chain on here, you actually name it for the benzene ring because it's higher priority. Okay. And that follows the same functional group priority we saw for all of the other all right, so now that we have benzene, we actually have some common names, okay? If we just have a methyl group attached to the benzene ring, we call it toluene, okay, toluene. It's a special name, you do have to remember that. However, all other alkyl groups, just uh, long chain alkanes, are named as the alkane first and then the benzene second. So that would be the common name for it, or you can also name it uh, 1-phenyl-ethane one one would also be another appropriate name for this. 
However, once they have a common name like this, you have to name it for that. So in this case here with a methyl group here, it's called toluene. With a, a vinyl group, this is the, a, a double bond with three hydrogens on it. We call this styrene. And you may have familiar with that name, called, you know, they make a polymer out of this called polystyrene. And we'll talk about that in chapter 16, but styrene is the common name for having a vinyl group attached to a benzene. Now, if you convert it to an alcohol, it has a special name. Imagine phenyl alcohol, squish that together, phenol. Phenol right here. So that's its common name is the all of phenyl and so phenol. If we have a nitrogen group here, I mean, sorry, an amine, not a, just any old nitrogen, we call that aniline. Okay. And so that's a, a special name you have. Uh, benzaldehyde is just aldehyde, but with the benzene added to it. And benzoic acid is carboxylic acid with benzene added to it. <clears throat> and then the last special name is this one with this methoxy group here. Normally methoxy doesn't get to change the name. It's almost always a substituent to a long chain in either, except in the case of benzene, when you have a methoxy group on benzene, we call it anisole. Okay. So these are a few of the little things you do have to remember because uh, they are so commonly used in these names, you'll have to use them time and time. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> now let's talk about bin naming benzenes and naming them with other things. Okay. So if this is benzene with six hydrogens on it, if we take one hydrogen off and attach anything to this group right here, it becomes the phenyl group. Just like we have the hexyl group, it becomes the phenyl group. Okay. okay, so that means when we name it, we name it for the long chain first, and then the phenyl group is our substituent. So in this case here, we have one, two, three, four hydro, four carbons, and a double bond. So it's two butene for the four carbons on the double bond, and we have it on the two position. So it's two phenyl as our substituent. And this particular one has this highest priority group and this highest priority group on the same side, so it's Z. However, that's only if it's directly bonded to benzene ring. Okay. If you have something like toluene and pull this hydrogen off and hook it to something right here, this is now the benzyl group. Okay. So this is commonly known as pH, as phenyl, and this is the benzyl group. This changes its reactivity because this is an sp2 hybridized carbon. This is an sp3 hybridized carbon. That's why we have different names for them, okay? So in the case of this, we're adding it as a substituent. So our, our alcohol actually names it. So it's ethanol for the ethyl, the ethane alcohol. And then the phenyl substituent is on the last thing. But in this case here, the benzyl group takes priority because it used to be toluene, now it's the benzyl group. And we just name whatever is attached to it, like alkyl chloride. So it'd be benzyl chloride. Okay, so that's if we only have one thing attached to benzene. Now we have another weird way of saying how to have two things attached to benzene. And it's called the ortho, meta, and para. Okay. So ortho is where you have the two substituents on the first carbon and then one carbon over. So in the one position and the two position. The meta is where it's in the one position and then you skip over the second one and there's still a hydrogen there. And you go to the third carbon and that's the meta. And then if they're opposite each other on the ring, that's called para. Okay. So if we look at this right here, right here, um, it's going to be named for the methyl group here. So it's going to be named toluene. And this is going to name it as its number one spot because it's naming the compound as toluene. So that means the two, the three, and the four position over here <coughs> will give you four bromo toluene. Same thing here. This is the aniline group. So we have to name it for aniline, which means this is one, two, and three. So we now have three chloroaniline or meta. Notice this is italicized M that stands for meta. So three chloroaniline is correct, but it's also known as meta chloroaniline. Okay. 
And notice we use a little P here for pair for the one four. So if we have two methyl groups though, that changes the name again, okay? In its common name, it's called xylene, okay? However, because it's now two different methyl groups, we can actually name it for the substituents, 1,3-dimethylbenzene. But in the common name, it's gonna be meta for 1,2,3-xylene. So, and I don't have an ortho example here, but if we had something like this, a CL, CL and CL attached here, that would be one, two, dichloro benzene or meta dichloro. Okay. So the ortho meta para is very uh, unique to benzene rings. And so the ortho is one, two, meta is one, three, para is one, four. All right, questions on that. We're gonna have uh, an activity with nomenclature of aromatic compounds at some point. I, I haven't quite scheduled it, but I know it's coming up soon. Okay, <clears throat> now, once we get to beyond that, we can't use the ortho meta pair anymore. Once we have three or more substituents, we go back to naming it almost the same way as our systematic name. We find the primary group or the group that names the compound, and then that always is number one. And then you try to find the lowest number of uh, lowest number possible, and then list them in alphabetical order. Okay. So our rules change once we get to that three. The only difference is we will have to name it for that benzene name. So if we have a nitro group, that doesn't change the benzene. It is just nitrobenzene. We have a chloro group, it doesn't change the name, it's chlorobenzene, but the methyl group does. The methyl group makes it toluene. So we have to number the lowest possible, and so we'd have to go in this direction here to give us four chloro, two nitro, toluene. Okay. So if we look at this, uh, the halogens don't change the name of the benzene, only the alcohol does, which makes it phenol. And so our only three positions available are the two, four, six. So it's two, four, six, tribromo phenol. And then this one here, let's see, we have an ethyl group, we have a bromine and a nitro group. None of those change the name of the benzene. So we just have to do it in alphabetical order. And we do it in alphabetical order with the lowest number possible, okay? And since these two are closest together, it's probably gonna be one, two, and then go in the direction where you have the four at the lowest number. So the last case is where no, no special name is, but now we go with alphabetical order. Well, numerical order first, the lowest, remember if we numbered it this way, it'd be one, four, six. So that would be, if we numbered it from this way, it'd be one, three, four. So, the way it's numbered is the lowest possible number. And then once we have the lowest possible number, we go in alphabetical order, two bromo, one ethyl, four nitro, benzene. Okay, so this is why it's important to know those names, those special names for the benzene rings. And next, all right. So just like we have special names, if they have a group attached to them and they have different properties, you also have special names for these polynuclears, okay? Meaning that you have multiple rings fused together, okay? Don't worry about the names here. I just wanna show you that they have different names. Just two benzene rings together like this is called naphthalene. And you may have heard that, you know, they used to use this as a bug repellent a long time ago. They called it mothballs. That's naphthalene, it's an it's a aromatic compound that, that scares away insects, okay? And then if you got three of them together, anthracene, this is really cool because it grow, glows bright white under UV light. And then a derivatives related to it, including pyrene. Okay. But there's no limit to the number of these things you can do, okay? In fact, if you think about, you know, uh, pencil lead is actually called graphene. Well, it's a continuous sheet of this six membered rings just going out for uh, almost an infinite sheet. And that would be graphite. Okay. 
So one of the issues associated with these things is if they react oddly in the body, they can become carcinogenic. Carcinogenic by definition is something that causes cancer, okay? So the idea is that some of these compounds react differently in the liver. And in this particular case, it's an enzyme metabolized system that turns it into this compound that can then be uh, actually intercalated into your DNA and therefore causing a cancer causing mutation. Okay. So it doesn't mean that all aromatic compounds are bad, but some of them have been shown to cause issues. But a lot of them are certain flavorants we have in our meats and our foods and everything as well. So it's just, it's not all aromatic compounds, it's just some of them are considered carcinogenic, including benzene itself is considered carcinogenic. Okay, so we don't have that many reactions we can do directly to benzene. Uh, well, that's not true. We have a certain class of reactions we can do on benzene. However, we also have a really cool reaction we can do to side chains on benzene. It can be a methyl group or an ethyl group. It can be any alkyl group, as long as there's at least one hydrogen on that position here. There has to be at least one hydrogen on this carbon next to benzene. If there is, it will oxidize all the hydrogens and all the carbons off to give you a carboxylic acid. And we call that the benzylic oxidation. And we usually use something really strong oxidizing agent. Now, uh, when we get to our ketones and aldehydes chapter, we're gonna look into a lot more about oxidation. And so I'm gonna go over these oxidants in that position, in that chapter. However, these are two are very strong oxidants, we'll see again. And they'll oxidize the methyl group or anything as long as there's at least one hydrogen there down to a carboxylic acid. Okay, so <clears throat> this is used extensively in industry. For example, uh, this 1,4-dimethylbenzene or paraxylene is really common in uh, gasoline and so what they do is they take that particular derivative of it and oxidize it down to this dicarboxylic acid. Mm -hmm. This dicarboxylic acid is used extensively in polymer production, basically making polyethylene terephthalate. Polyethylene terephthalate is not only a fiber, it's not only a film, but it's also most of those plastic bottles that have water in them, most of those are polyethylene terephthalate. And so that what that means is that they took the xylene compound, oxidized it to this terephthalic acid, and then they reacted it with this ethane diol and turned it into a polymer. And we'll talk more about polymers in chapter 16. But I just wanted to show you, this is a, an, uh, an reaction you can do with those methyl groups to create some other compound. All right, questions on benzylic oxidation. It's one of the few oxidations we have in this chapter. Most of the other things we're gonna do are what we call substitution reaction. Okay, <clears throat> so moving right along, okay. Let's talk about all the other reactions of benzene we have, okay. So all of the re other reactions besides that benzylic oxidation reaction is, are gonna be substitution reactions. Basically, we're gonna displace a hydrogen for the most part and put something else on there. But unlike adding across a double bond where we go all the way to sigma bonds, we're gonna do a substitution because it wants to stay aromatic. And so what's gonna happen is it's gonna find some intermediate to get that uh, species on there, like the chloride, for example, but then it's gonna lose a proton so it can re-aromatize because it's more stable that way. So benzenes rarely do addition reactions. There's only one it does, which is a hydrogenation. Almost all the other reactions are substitution reactions and they all follow the same mechanism, which I'll go over now. So the first thing we can do is we can take benzene right here and take a halogen and we can substitute. If we took that chlorine and gave it to, and put it with ethylene, it would just add across there and give us dichloroethylene. And it happens pretty readily. It doesn't even take much um, heat or catalyst. 
However, we cannot do that reaction if we don't have a catalyst. And notice we have this catalyst here, FeCl3, which is a uh, Lewis acid catalyst. Okay, I have an interesting question in the chat room. Uh, increase of benzene and its derivatives and consumer goods uh, related to the more prevalent cancer trend in the modern age, just curious. Uh, you could answer whenever you have time. Uh, the I, the um, I don't think it's directly corollary to benzene and benzene derivatives because uh, we have, uh, as a society, used benzene and benzene derivatives and oil and oil derivatives for thousands of years. Uh, tar pits and other things, there's also benzene and benzene derivatives naturally found in a lot of different things. Uh, and sulfur vents and, and volcanoes and burning wood creates some of these things here. So uh, I'm not a cancer specialist, but I don't think I've ever seen that as a corollary to benzene derivatives itself. It might just be a corollary to um, the idea that you can be exposed to more things because we move around more, we do more, we, we have more. So, but I don't think it's directly corollary. I'd have to go look that up, sorry. All right, <clears throat> so back to the reactions of benzene. We're gonna do several things with benzene that are all gonna have the same mechanism. Okay? And they're all gonna be substitution reactions. Okay, so in this case here, we'll have, if we had chlorine right here and we just tried to react chlorine by itself with benzene, it would not react. We have to have this catalyst here and I'll show you why in a minute. So when it, we do that, what we do is we generate our new sigma bond with our chlorine, but then we generate HCl. So this H is actually the H from the hydrogen and one of these chlorines is from the chlorine. So the entire molecule of chlorine gas is absorbed, is consumed in the reaction. One is bonded to the benzene, one creates this HCl. Now, the next reaction we have is what we call nitration. And when we call nitration, we take a nitric acid right here, but we have to use a catalyst. Again, I'll show you why. And when we do that, what we'll end up doing is adding We'll take an OH off this and add an NO3 to the ring. The OH is gonna be added to the hydrogen coming off. And so we end up with water and, I'm sorry, NO2. We took one of the oxygens here and the hydrogen here, and then that leaves us NO2 and we added NO2 to the ring. So again, the entire molecule of nitric acid plus that hydrogen are consumed in the reaction. And again, this is our catalyst. So the next reaction I want to show you is called sulfonation. Basically, we use, we can add SO3H or a sulfonic acid to the benzene ring. And it turns out that this right here is enough of an acid by itself. It, it catalyzes itself and it does that same substitution. So we end up liberating water and putting the rest of the acid on the benzene ring. All right, so those are pretty straightforward and we have acid catalyzed systems getting us on there to give us these new functional groups. The halogen on there, the nitro on there, and the sulfonic acid. Now, the next two reactions, we're gonna add carbon-carbon bonds. Okay, so they're different. We call them alkylation and acylation, okay? So alkylation, like the name says, we're going to put an alkyl group on there. Okay. In acylations, we're going to come up with getting a ketone directly on that benzene ring, and then whatever the other group here is. So alkylation, we have an alkyl group. Acylation, we'll end up with a ketone, a phenyl ketone. Okay, so the way we would do that is we take an alkyl halide and a catalyst. Notice this is aluminum chloride. We used before with the halogenations, iron chloride. So we have two, three different catalysts, acid catalyst, FeCl, iron catalyst, and aluminum catalyst. We use the aluminum catalyst with the alkylations and the acylation. 
Now notice we have to use a derivative of carboxylic acid to do it here. It has to be an alkyl halide, I'm sorry, acyl halide. We'll talk about that in a little bit too. But the net result is we're gonna liberate an acid and we're gonna have that alkyl group attach. We're gonna liberate an acid and have that alkyl group attach. Okay, so I told you they all use the same mechanism. All right, let's talk about that mechanism. All right, up to now we used SN1 and SN2 reaction. S stands for substitution, N stands for nucleophilic, and the one and two decides whether or not you have one molecule or two in its transition state. Now, in the case of aromatic rings, we do electrophilic aromatic substitution because the benzene ring is a whole bunch of electrons. And so we have something that wants to attack those electrons come and attack the benzene ring. So it's almost like the opposite of those other reactions, but we're gonna do a substitution reaction, call that electrophilic aromatic substitution, which means we have to have the benzene attacked by an electrophile. An electrophile is typically something with a positive charge on it. So the first step in all of our mechanisms is to generate this positively charged species to come in and attack the benzene ring. Now, why, do we, why does it always go through substitution? Because that energy of aromatizing makes it want to go back to aromatic. So even if an intermediate breaks up the aromatization, it will kick out something, usually hydrogen, to reform the aromatic ring. And so that's why we see hydrogen being kicked out so it can get back to the aromatic ring. Okay, so <clears throat> we need to form an electrophile. It's going to attack the benzene ring because it's super electron rich, and then it's gonna kick out hydrogen so that it can re-aromatize. All right, so how do we do this? So first step is forming that plus. Now, how do we form that plus? Well, there's a couple different ways, and I think it's gonna have something to do with Lewis acid, Lewis space. Second step is we're gonna have the electrons from our um, benzene ring reach out and grab at that electrophile, okay? And the reason the benzene ring is reaching out and grabbing is those are the electrons creating the new sigma bond, okay? When it does that, those electrons that were balancing charge on this atom are no longer there and we now have a positive charge on that carbon. But we also have an interesting factor here, is that because we have these p orbitals and these p orbitals in conjugation with that positive charge, we can write resonance structures that move that charge around the ring. So that makes this intermediate more stable than it should have been. And so it'll start on this carbon and then it'll move to the third carbon over, and then it'll move to the third carbon over, and it'll keep going around and around and around until it takes the electrons away from the hydrogen to re -aromatize. And that's step three. Step three is when we have something tug on this nitrogen just enough. Remember, hydrogen can't leave by itself as a positive charge. It has to have some other electrons engulf it and leave its electrons behind. So in that case here, we have something that acts as a base, something with a lone pair. Reach out and grab this hydrogen that kicks these electrons back in. We re-aromatize the ring and we lose our charge. So that's step three. So form an electrophile, it reacts with the ring to give that positive charge that moves around the ring. And then we have something pull on a hydrogen that re-aromatizes. Now notice I have it pulling on this hydrogen here. Why not pull it off on this hydrogen or this hydrogen or this hydrogen? Well, those hydrogens aren't as acidic because those are on sp2 hybridized carbons. This is on an sp3 hybridized carbon, meaning it's the most acidic of the set in this particular case. And technically, it allows this carbon to go back to being an sp2 hybridized carbon. So when this goes back to sp2, we can re-aromatize. All right, so those are the three steps. Let's look at each of the different reagents we have. Okay, 
So in the case of the halogens, we have to use iron chloride. So if we're using chlorine, we use iron chloride or ferric chloride. If we're using bromine, we actually use ferric bromide. We match the halogen on the catalyst to the halogen we're trying to add to the mix. Okay. So in this case here, we form the electrophile. Now let's think about this little compound here. We have chlorine, chlorine. They both have the same electronegativity. So that's a non-polar bond. Okay. And we have a lot of lone pairs. We would expect those lone pairs to act as a Lewis base. So how is that an electrophile? Well, it's not. So we need to make it an electrophile. So what happens is we have our Lewis space interact with our iron center on our iron chloride. The iron actually is electron deficient and therefore is a Lewis acid is willing to accept those electrons. So when it does that, it forms this intermediate here, this molecular complex, and the net charge on the complex is zero. But we have two bonds to chlorine, and it doesn't like that. We'd rather have one bond to chlorine or be an ion. So what happens is it moves electrons from the bond between the two chlorines to give us a chlorine plus and this iron chlorine four minus. And that ion pair is nice and stable. But now look what we have. We have a chlorine with a positive charge. We now have our electron. Okay, now that we have our electrophile, the next thing that can happen is those electrons gonna reach out and grab that electrophile. So we take this pair of electrons that is in this double bond, reaches out, forms that new sigma bond. Both of these uh, pi electrons are gonna come out and form that new sigma bond, giving us our positive charge. And that positive charge is gonna move around the ring. Okay. So we might have to start thinking about um, what is gonna be on these positions as to if it's gonna help or hurt that reaction. But it'll move around the ring and it'll just do that until something acting as a base comes along, okay? In this case, it looks like the chlorine portion, this right here is negatively charged, okay? So the chlorine is gonna reach out and grab that hydrogen with two electrons regenerating our catalyst. And because the chlorine is acting as the base and grab those hydrogens, these electrons kick back in to give us our aromatic ring. We have HCl plus we've regenerated our Lewis acid catalyst. Okay. So we're actually going to do every single one of those steps in all the other reactions as well. We just have to do a different acid catalyst in each of them. Okay. So in a nitration, the way we generate the nucleophile is we actually use sulfuric acid to help dehydrate the nitric acid by having the um, nitric acid act as a base and take away a proton to turn it into this sulfate ion. When we do that, we now have the conjugate acid of nitric acid. Okay. Now notice something special about this we have this subgroup here. That would make a really good leaving group because it would leave as neutral water. So what happens is once we form this complex here, uh, the, this portion of the molecule takes its electrons and leaves as neutral water, generating a positively charged NO2, our nitronium. That's our electrophile. Now that we have our nitronium ion, it can go ahead and react with benzene and then kick out a hydrogen and regenerate the acid catalyst. So let's go on with those Friedel Crafts alkylations. This is making the new carbon carbon. So we have to do the same thing. We have to make a Lewis acid and or something with a positive charge on it to make it a Lewis, I mean to make it a, a an electrophile. Okay. So in the case of this compound here, where we have an alkyl halide here, we have our Lewis acid catalyst. And when we do that, we can actually form our alkyl group on this ring. However, we have to pay attention. 
because the intermediate in the Friedel Crafts alkylation is a carbocation, which means we're not going to have primary carbocations very often. Secondary carbocations are pretty good, and tertiary carbons are more stable. So you have to watch out for rearrangement. So what's the first step here? The first step is generating our carbocation. Okay? And it's easier to generate the carbocation when we have this catalyst because the aluminum center right here is electron deficient. So the electrons from the chlorine can come out and reach out and make a bond just like they did with the iron chloride in the chlorine one. Okay? But it's different because we need to make a stronger connection. Once we do that, the electrons that are in between the alkyl halide and the carbon transfer to give us our carbocation and our counterbalancing ion, aluminum tetrachloride. Now, that carbocation is now our electrophile. So then we just, of course, do the same thing we always do when we have our electrophile react. It's going to give us our positive charge destabilized along the ring. And then eventually something's gonna come along and act as a base and pull that hydrogen off such that it re-aromatizes the ring. And in this case, it's the chlorine that's bound to the aluminum. It reaches out and grabs that hydrogen, leaves those electrons to re-aromatize the ring, okay? So again, that's the great thing about this chapter is all of these substitution reactions all have the same mechanism. You just have to make sure you have the right catalyst to form your electrophile. Okay, so one of the limitations for these alkylations is it's only practical if you can form a secondary or tertiary carbocation. Okay, you have to form a secondary or tertiary carbocation. So if you had a secondary alkyl halide like an isopropyl group or a tertiary alkyl halide, they're gonna form very readily, you will be able to use them. You cannot form a straight chain off of there. Also, because of the nature of the reacting of the carbocation, you can't have electron withdrawing groups on there. Now, what do I mean by electron withdrawing group? An electron withdrawing group is anything with a formal charge of positive or partially positive charge. Right. Now, when we looked at the, this functional group here, we said that the oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. Therefore, it's polar in the direction of the oxygen, which means the carbon has a partially positive charge. Notice that that's true for all of these species here. All of those carbonyls have a partially positive carbon. That deactivates the ring. The alkylation. Likewise, this has a formal, these have a uh, partial positive formal charges or positive formal charges. They deactivate the ring. And then these, because of electrons drawing from the halogens, are partially positive and they deactivate the ring. So when in doubt, look at your Lewis dot structure and figure out if the bond is polar, if the bond is polar and pulling away from the benzene ring to make it more positive, it's going to deactivate the ring to electrophilic substitution. And so think about that. We have to have those electrons reach out and grab our electrophile. So if you're pulling those electrons away from that pi cloud with one of these groups, it's going to react less readily. And okay, great. So <clears throat> the alternative to Friedel Crafts alkylations is the Friedel Crafts acylation. In the case of the acylation, we're going to put on that ketone. We're going to put on that carbonyl group. And it's actually easier to form that partially positive charge, that electrophile, with an acyl chloride. What we mean by that is it's a carboxylic acid. So this would be acetic acid right here. And we're going to take off that OH and add a chlorine. So that's what we call an acyl halide. It's the, it's the chlorine version of a carboxylic acid. Now, the reason we do that is that chlorine's a better leaving group. 
and therefore it's more easily to form the positive charge on this carbon with chlorine. So <clears throat> we take our acid halide, it reacts with the aluminum chloride to give us our acyl cation plus aluminum tetrachloride, and then it goes ahead and reacts to form our chloride. So let's look at that first step of our mechanism. Okay. Just like before, some part of our starting material has to act as a Lewis uh, base. And in this case here, we actually have the chlorine here acting as the base, donating electrons, this should say base, uh, and forming our polarized bond. So our chlorine now has a positive charge, but we formed a sigma bond with the aluminum. That's gonna break this bond. That's the weakest bond we have right now. And it's gonna generate our carbonyl with a positive charge on it. That's our electrophile. And it's counterbalanced by this aluminum tetrachloride. Then the next thing that happens, of course, is of course you have the benzene ring reach out and grab it, and then it liberates hydrogen. Okay, so, this is another way, that's the alkylation, but you don't always have to use aluminum chloride as a catalyst to make a carbocation. What we can do is we can actually use strong acids to generate a carbocation by using a double bond. So in the case of a strong acid, what you can do is you can add a hydrogen to a double bond, giving you an intermediate. So if we took a, a, a proton added a proton to this double bond, it would give us this as our intermediate, and this would act as our electrophile. Okay. So we can use some strong acids like sulfuric or phosphoric acid to also generate a carbocation. But in the alkylation and the acylation, we must form a carbocation. The carbocation does not move if you form it as the acyl right here because it's trapped on that carbonyl carbon it cannot move so you always get attachment where the carbonyl was that's why you always get the ketone okay let's see what else do we have ah. so and in the case of tertiaries it's actually easier to get the carbocation to form because what we can do is we can actually uh, create a tertiary alcohol right here with acid. And in general, you can think about it, it protonates the alcohol first. The alcohol then leaves as neutral water, giving you your carbocation right there. That's a very stable tertiary carbocation, therefore it doesn't move and we get the attachment of our tertiary carbon directly to the benzene. Okay, questions on the mechanism. The mechanism on all of these is form that electrophile first, form that positive charge, and then all the rest of the mechanism is the same. Okay, so now that's for taking benzene and reacting to it, okay? However, if you already have something on benzene rings, you're going to have two different things happen. Number one, that thing is going to direct where that next thing is gonna be added. Number two, it's gonna either speed up or slow down the reaction, okay? So when we talk about that, we have what we call orientation or direction. The group already on the benzene ring is going to direct where the substituting happens, okay? So there's two options we have here. You can direct something based on what your already attached benzene is and what we call an orthopara, okay? So it's either gonna be right next to the substitution or completely opposite the substitution. That's what we call orthopara direction, okay? The other option is meta direction. It's always gonna be in that third carbon over and that's meta direction. Okay, so we have two types of direction, ortho and para direction and meta direction. Now the rate is different. Rate is either 
activated towards substitution or deactivated towards substitution. Deactivation doesn't mean it does not happen. Deactivation means it happens slower or you have to use more heat. Okay. So we have to kind of get in our heads orientation and rate, activation and deactivation because they're going to run hand in hand. Okay. So what do I mean by that? Certain groups are going to direct ortho and para. Okay, so anything that is electron donating or anything that has lone pairs near it is going to be an ortho para director. Okay. And it comes down to that ring that we had where that positive charge is going around in that intermediate. That's why. And where that substitution happened is because of that. Okay, so any, so this methoxy group or anisole, right here, is an ortho pair direct. So if we took, uh, in this case, we're using acetic acid as our catalyst uh, with our bromine, it's gonna make the ortho derivative and the pair derivative. Notice there's a little bit of both, okay? Now, the only reason this is the major portion here is because of sterics. So there's a, this is a little bit bigger than the two hydrogens over here, and therefore most of it goes opposite because this is the ortho position and this is the para position. So it's an ortho para direct. So if those are ortho para directors, things that have a positive charge or a pos, po, partially positive charge are meta direct. So if we did our formal charge on this nitrogen, we would see that it has a formal charge of plus one and one of these oxygens has a formal charge of minus one, okay? So that means this nitrogen has a formal charge of plus one. So electron withdrawing, things with partial or full positive charges are meta directors, okay? Meta directors, okay? Which means that once you have one group on there, you're gonna get it that third carbon over in either direction. So notice that 93% of it is that meta direction, although you get a little bit of the two other isomers. So it's directing, it's not 100%, it's just directing to that position. Okay. So in general, we can divide them into two classes, okay? Ortho and pair directing and meta directing, okay? Now, Within ortho pair directors, we have what we call strong activators, which makes the reaction go very quickly. Okay. And those are the ones that have a lone pair. All of these have lone pairs directly next to the benzene ring. Okay. Now, if we have a lone pair, but then like a carbonyl next to it, it's not as activated because that carbonyl is pulling a little bit of that electron density away. Therefore, it's activating, but only moderately. And again, these are all ortho pair directors. So those lone pairs are ortho pair directing. Okay. Now, the carbon carbon bond, whether it's aromatic or aliphatic, those are nonpolar bonds. Okay. Which means they're slightly inductively activating. So they're a little bit weak activating, but they are ortho pair directors because they're not pulling electron density away from the ring. Now, inductively, basically by what it can pull through this sigma bond, it's deactivating. But because of the lone pairs can donate back to the benzene ring, it's an ortho para director because it has lone pairs. Okay? All these have lone pairs, and so the lone pairs are telling you ortho para direction. Although, because they're electronegative atoms, they're pulling some electron density out. So they're deactivating, but they're ortho pair directors. Now, let's look at the meta directors. Carbonyl compound, carbonyl compound, carbonyl compound, carbonyl compound, carbonyl compound. So anytime you see a carbonyl on there, you're thinking meta directing and deactivating. So I'm gonna have to hit it with a lot more heat or a higher concentration. And then our strong deactivators are, this nitrogen has a formal plus one charge. This has a positive charge. 
This has three groups pulling electron density away from that carbon, so it's an electron withdrawing group. Three halogens pulling electron density away, it deactivates the ring. Therefore, it's a meta director and deactivate. Okay. So, when in doubt, look for your lone pairs or a nonpolar bond. Those tend to be ortho pair directors. Anything with a carbonyl or a partially positive charge on it is a deactivator meta directors. Okay, questions on ortho pair direction, meta direction, and activators versus deactivators. When you do the homework, go ahead and you know use apply that rule. Are there electrons? Is it partially positive? Is it a polar bond? And you should be able to pick out the meta direction and the ortho pair direction fairly clearly. Okay. So, in general, in general, alkyl groups, phenyl groups. And substituents with the atom bonded directly to the ring having unshared electrons, i.e., lone pairs, are ortho pair directing. Okay. So we're looking for carbons and things with lone pairs are ortho pair directing. Everything else is a meta director. All ortho pair directors, except for halogens, are activators. Okay. They're Halogens still have lone pairs, so they're ortho pair directing, but they are a little more electronegative than the carbon, and therefore they are weakly deactivated. So it's still ortho pair because of lone pairs, but uh, more electronegative. All meta directing groups carry either a partial or a full positive charge on the atom bonded to the ring. Okay, so what does that say? Well, Let's say we wanted to make one particular isomer of a compound. And we started with something like toluene. So toluene itself is an ortho pair director. However, we actually want to end up with a compound that's meta. Okay? So if we were to take our toluene here and nitrate it, and then do our benzylic oxidation to turn it into a carboxylic acid here, um, if we were to nitrate it, it's an ortho pair director, meaning its primary um, product would be the para, the para nitro toluene. And then when we oxidized it, we get the para nitro benzoic acid. So that's not the isomer we want. So even though this is an activated reaction and would happen faster, we get the wrong isomer. Okay, so let's do it backwards. Let's go ahead and oxidize this first and turn it into an ortho pair direct, turn it into a meta director. Now it's deactivated. We have to use more strenuous, more heat, and it won't give us a higher yield, but we get the isomer we want. So that's where ortho pair direction and activation come in play. We can play with, oh, it would be much higher yield to go this way, but wrong isomer. This is going to be a lower yield, but right isomer. So that's where the interplay of um, the activation versus direction comes in. <coughs> and okay, I'm going to go into that next time. So. <coughs> Questions about direction and isomers. Don't see anything coming unmuted, so hopefully you heard all that. Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop recording. And so I'll see you on Wednesday if I don't see you before. And go ahead and read up the chapters and look at the uh, videos online, please.